Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants Hangout. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. If this is your first time joining one of our events, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants is all about bringing science, adventure, exploration, and conservation live into classrooms across North America and beyond. As such, we have a very exciting virtual field trip planned for today. We're really excited uh, <laughs> to be taking a little trip to the Royal British Columbia Museum, uh, obviously in British Columbia. We are going to be joining Victoria Arbor, who is a vertebrate paleontologist and evolutionary biologist. She's the curator of paleontology at the museum. And she's also a leading expert in the paleobiology of the armored dinosaur known as Ankylosaurus. She has named several new species of Ankylosaurus, studied how they used and evolved their charismatic armor and weaponry, and investigated how their biogeography was shaped uh, throughout areas of Asia and North America. So today, she's joining us live from a new exhibit at the Royal British Columbia Museum, where we'll learn more about the dinosaur named Buster found <laughs> years ago in British Columbia. All right, Victoria, it's so great to have you joining us live today through the magic of technology. We're excited to check <laughs> out the new exhibit, get to know you a little more, and uh, the classrooms are going to fire away with some questions. Amazing. Well, thank you all so much for tuning in uh, to all our listeners everywhere, especially this is really fun to be doing during Science Literacy Week. And I'm very excited to talk about my little friend Buster here. So I'm Victoria. I live in Victoria, which is a little bit confusing sometimes, but we all like to joke about that. Um, this is the Royal BC Museum on Vancouver Island in British Columbia, Canada. And um, I joined the Royal BC Museum about a year ago as their new curator of paleontology. So that means I help look after the fossil collection. Um, I do research and I get to talk to people like you about what goes on here at the museum, which is a lot of fun. Uh, and so I have worked a lot on armored dinosaurs, which are my favorite dinosaurs, but I've got a new group of dinosaurs that might be my new favorite group because they're found here in British Columbia where I work and where I do my field work. So I'm really excited to talk to you about that today. And I hope that you will think of lots of questions while we're going through this exhibit. You can ask me questions about how we find fossils or anything about dinosaurs, this particular dinosaur or any other ones you wanna know about. So think about those questions and ask them after we've done a little tour. Uh, I'm standing here in the Royal BC Museum's pocket gallery. So this is a special little exhibit space where we can highlight cool new research that's happening right here at the museum. And it rotates out and there are new exhibits four times a year here. And so Buster, our dinosaur, just went on display here a couple of weeks ago at the beginning of September. So you're some of the first folks who get to have a chance to see it. And so we're gonna do a little tour through the exhibit and then you can ask me questions. So Buster is a dinosaur I've actually known for a very long time at this point. This is a little dinosaur specimen that was donated to Dalhousie University, way on the other side of the country in Nova Scotia, because that's where I grew up and that's where I was doing um, my undergrad research uh, back in like 2004, 2005. And so this specimen was actually found in 1971 by a geologist named Kenny Larson, who was walking along uh, a railway track that was in construction. And so there was lots of fresh rock that had been disturbed as people were sort of carving this railway grade up in Northern British Columbia. And he found these dinosaur bones and he thought they were pretty neat. So he hung on to them for a long time. And then he decided they probably should be at a university or a museum. And so that's how I met this particular dinosaur specimen. It was donated to the place where I was doing my undergraduate studies um, back a long time ago. So now it lives here permanently at the Royal British Columbia Museum. It's part of our collection. Its catalog number is RBCM P900. Um, and it's a specimen that I studied a long time ago and have now revisited now that I know a lot more than I did 15 years ago. Um, and uh, I'm getting some new interpretations. So that's one of the fun things about science is the more you learn, the more you realize you were wrong earlier and you get to like revise things and you're always coming back to um, sort of revisit things that you've done in your past. So back when I was an undergrad and I didn't know as much as I know now, the best interpretation we could make of the, this little set of bones is that they belong to maybe some small bipedal, which means two-legged plant-eating dinosaur. And you can see that's very different from what we're showing on this little picture now. This dinosaur walks on four legs. Um, it's still a plant eater, but it's, we now think, belongs to a group of dinosaurs called Leptoceratopsidae. 
So that's a bit of a mouthful, but it basically is a group of dinosaurs that are closely related to Triceratops, but look a little bit different. So Triceratops is that really famous dinosaur, a big frill on the back of its head, all these big horns over the eyes and on the nose. And they're really huge. Triceratops is like the size of an elephant. on four legs, uh, but it only gets to be a couple of meters long. So it's not elephant size. This is about as big as Buster and its related species could have gotten. So you might notice that we've only got a couple of bones here on this particular outline of a skeleton. So we don't have a full skeleton of Buster, but we have parts of the skeleton that help us know what kind of dinosaur it was. So we've got parts of the shoulder. I'm gonna sort of point with my shadow. There's parts of the shoulder. This is the scapula and the coracoid. We've got parts of the arm, the radius and the ulna. So those are the lower arm bones. We've got part of the hind leg. So this is the tibia and the fibula is on the other side, but basically the shin bones and a little bit of the ankle. And then some of the parts that I think are really cool, we've got the toe bones with this kind of blunt claw down at the bottom. So my shadow is a little hard to see here, but here's two toes made of multiple phalanges. That's what we call the bones that make up your fingers and toes. So by looking at the shapes of these different bones, we can identify what part of the body they belong to and also what kind of dinosaur they belong to. And one of the things I'm working on right now is trying to figure out what species of leptoceratopsid buster might be. So triceratops is a species of ceratopsian dinosaur, but we don't know what species of leptoceratopsid buster is. Uh, I have a sneaking suspicion it's a new species, but it doesn't have a scientific name yet. So we're going to just keep calling it Buster for now. So that's Buster. We've got a really wonderful illustration of what Buster might have looked like here. This is by my friend and colleague Raven Amos, and she's a wonderful dinosaur artist. And so this is a little bit of an idea of what Buster might look like. So this one's sort of standing up on its two legs, uh, two hind legs, but they probably walked around on four legs most of the time. It's got that short frill and a parrot-like beak. And it's sort of shown here with some fluffy chicks, which is kind of cute. We don't know exactly what Buster's little babies and chicks might've looked like, but I like the little fluffy chicks in this illustration a lot. So Buster was found in Northern British Columbia. I'm gonna sort of, we're gonna zoom in on the map up here. So Victoria is found way down at the very bottom of British Columbia. And Buster came from an area near the Sustut River up in Northern British Columbia. So it takes a, it's really far up North. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty interesting place to try to go explore. It's sort of north of this area called Smithers. So one of the things that I wanted to do ever since I met Buster the dinosaur was I wanted to go look and see if we could find more fossils from where Buster was first found. I wanted to do that because I wanted to see if we could find more of Buster or more other dinosaurs or other fossils. And we also wanted to know what the geologic age of Buster was so that we can put it in context with other dinosaurs that have been found in places like Alberta or Montana. Uh, and the only way to do that is to like get on the ground and hike around and look for rocks and fossils. So that's exactly what we did in 2017. So it took me a long time, but eventually we got there. We had support from the National Geographic Society. We took this really fun little bush plane um, with my colleagues from the Royal Ontario Museum. We got Tom Cullen. David Evans and Jade Simon, all fine paleontologists. And we went up to the Sustut River in 2017 and we hiked around along this old abandoned railway track and along the rivers and we took jet boats and explored and looked for more fossils, which was really, really fun. And this is what the scenery looks like up in that area. So it's these beautiful mountains. These are the Spina and Amanika Mountains. The Sustut River is running along here. And we went and, and looked for fossils. Now, one thing that's really tough is that there's a lot of trees in the way of the rocks up in that area. So finding fossils was really challenging, but we did find a few. We didn't find more fossils of Buster, but we did find a fossil of another vertebrate, a turtle. And it's got this really funny texture. This is a chunk of a turtle fossil. It's got, it looks kind of like a golf ball. When we first found it, we joked that we had found a fossil golf ball because it has this really funny pockmarked texture. And so this is actually part of a turtle that's called Basilemis, that's the species name for this uh, turtle. And it's an extinct type of turtle that we find often in Alberta and Montana. It was basically like a big freshwater terrestrial turtle 
um, that usually has like these really, really big carapaces, really big shells. So that's pretty cool to have been able to find one of the other inhabitants of Buster's ecosystem. Here's a picture of what it looks like to be hiking around along these, these like river valleys. We sort of hike along, there's these nice like cliffs and we just basically pick up every rock that looks interesting and take a look at it and see if we've found a fossil. And most of the time we don't, and then sometimes we do. Now, one thing that we found a lot of while we were there, we didn't find a lot of bones, but we did find a lot of really cool plant fossils. And so I don't actually know as much about plant fossils. So this was a lot of fun for me to dig into that sort of area of research and start to learn about what we can learn from plant fossils. Here's an example of what we might have found. So here's a modern leaf with these veins and the sort of little like veinlets coming off of it. And then you can see here on the rock, there's an impression of one that looks almost exactly the same, even though it's probably about 67 million years old. So, the, so we found examples of um, angiosperms, so flowering broad-leaved tree leaves. We also found leaves of plants called metasequoia, the dawn redwood, which is still alive today, and they, their leaves look like this. And we found examples of ancient ferns and also things like wood and stumps and charcoal, all kinds of interesting stuff. So we basically found Buster's food and we found Buster's forest that he would have been living in. So that was a lot of fun. But looking along the Sustat River was really challenging because it's uh, very forested and there's not a lot of rocks that are really easy to get to. So I wanted to find some other places in British Columbia that represent the same geological area, but maybe have a few more rocks exposed. And we had the perfect place to go visit this summer because a few years ago, um, our Alpine biodiversity team, uh, who usually goes there to study plants and insects, actually found a dinosaur tooth even further north in British Columbia. This is the tooth of a meat-eating dinosaur, a tyrannosaur. And they found it uh, even further north in British Columbia in what's called Satsizi Plateau Wilderness Provincial Park. So here's where the Sustat River is in this area, and here's where the Satsizi Plateau is, so even further north. So this summer we got to go on another really fun adventure, and we flew in a helicopter for like an hour, and landed and camped out on the side of this mountain, and hiked around where there were way more rocks than there were at the Sustat River site. And we found some dinosaur fossils, which was very exciting. And we're hoping that we can go back next year and maybe find some more buddies for Buster, which would be really exciting. So that's a little walk around tour. We've also got some examples here of tools of the trade that a paleontologist might use and some of the fossils that we found in 2017. So here we've got things like maps, my rock hammer, brushes and dental picks and chisels. And of course, the data labels that we use for when we collect fossils. And then we would have been using these tools to find some of these plant fossils. And here's our turtle. This is our Basil Emmys turtle fossil. You can see how it looks like a golf ball. So this is really fun. We've had a lot of fun um, working on this dinosaur. There's still more to learn about Buster uh, and Leptoceratopsids, trying to figure out if he's a new species. And we've still got lots of exploring to do in northern British Columbia to find more BC dinosaurs. So that's our little tour of here. I don't want to talk for too long because I want to hear questions from you guys. Um, so I think it's probably a good time to like hand it over to the classrooms and see what questions about dinosaurs you have for me. All right, Victoria. Well, thank you so much for taking us on that little tour and teaching us a little bit more about Buster. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it definitely looks like you've got an exciting job and it gets to take you to some pretty cool and remote places to find some of those fossils. <laughs> All right, yes, well, let's get into some classrooms. <laughs> but before we do, I wanna give a shout out to a few classrooms who are tuning in live right now. Big shout out to the French International School Great. in Philadelphia, as well as Division 7 at Yanadon Elementary School in Maple Ridge. So don't forget to send in some of those questions uh, and we'll work some in. But let's start meeting some of our live <laughs> camera Great. classrooms. All right. Uh, let's see. Let's go to Amherst View, Ontario to start. We've got some grade six, sevens hanging out with Mr. Richards. Let's get that microphone turned on. There it is. How are we doing grade six, sevens? Good. Good. All right, go ahead. Uh, is there any link between the chicken and the T-Rex? Oh, can you go a little louder? Ooh, is there any link between the chicken and the T-Rex? 
Oh, did I hear it right? Is there any link between the chicken and the T-Rex? Yeah. 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 Okay. That's a great question. There's a really strong link between chickens and T-Rexes. And same with turkeys too. So if you sit down for like Thanksgiving dinner in a few weeks in Canada or later this fall, in uh, if you're in America, uh, those turkeys are just really weird living dinosaurs, which is really fun. So even though people talk about dinosaurs having gone extinct at the end of the Cretaceous period, the end of the age of dinosaurs, that's not actually true. Most dinosaurs went extinct except for one branch of their family tree, the flying feathered birds. And we also know now that there's lots of feathered dinosaurs that weren't quite birds. So things like T-Rex's uh, ancestors and T-Rex's cousins actually had fluff and feathers on their bodies. Um, T-Rex itself probably was scaly just because it was so big, but lots of dinosaurs had feathers. Lots of dinosaurs um, had kind of like the ability to glide or they had sort of like, you can sort of trace the development of flight and wings in dinosaurs all the way through birds. You can see changes in the tail, how the tail gets shorter over time as you get closer to like living birds today. Um, yeah, and it's not hard to look at a living bird today, I think, and see a little bit of their dinosaur ancestors in them. So that's a really good question. <clears throat> All right, awesome question to start us off. And, you know, it's amazing how much things can change uh, over time. I remember growing up <laughs> with pictures of dinosaurs and none of them had feathers. Nobody even considered that possibility. So a lot changes as you do more research and we learn more and find more fossils a lot changes. All you need is like one really good fossil in paleontology to change a whole bunch of ideas that we might have had for a long time. All right, very cool. Let's head to Mrs. Becker's class in grade five is hanging out in San Diego, California. Let's get Ooh. that microphone turned on. How are we doing, San Diego? <laughs> <laughs> so are you still um, finding that, uh, that um, that dinosaur still like what's it called again? Just Buster. Buster. <laughs> Buster, the <dinosaur. laughs> Buster the dinosaur. Yeah, so Buster is a little easier to say than Leptoceratopsid from Northern British Columbia. So that's why we like to call him Buster. So yeah, so so unfortunately, I haven't found any more of Buster specifically. So we haven't found like Buster's head or part of Buster's tail, even though we looked really, really hard. I think it just has been too long since Buster was found. Buster was found in 1971. That was before I was born and probably before most of you were born. Um, and just a lot of time has passed and the forest has kind of grown in where Buster was first found. So when Buster was found, there was lots of construction happening, lots of exposed rock and all the trees had been cut down. Now the forest has kind of grown back in and covered up a lot of the rocks that we found Buster in or where Buster would have been found at first. So it's just really hard to find more of Buster specifically. But what I'm hoping is that I might find some of Buster's friends and foes in its ecosystem in some of these new places that I'm exploring. Um, but we're really at the very early days of exploring Northern British Columbia for dinosaur fossils. So they're not as well known as places like Montana or Wyoming or Alberta. We're kind of going into new territory for these kinds of fossils in British Columbia, which I think is pretty exciting, but also means it's kind of hard sometimes. All right, another great question. I'm gonna steal one from online uh, from okay. our uh, school at Maple Ridge. And they're wondering about the distance of time between the Triassic to the Jurassic period. Oh, that's a good question. And you're gonna catch me out here on not remembering all of my numbers, but the Triassic period started about 250 million years ago. Um, and I actually forget exactly when the Jurassic started right now. This is a nice thing as a paleontologist, you can usually sit there with books. Part of the reason I don't actually know that number off the top of my head is because I tend to work on dinosaurs from the Cretaceous period. So I know those numbers really well, and I don't know my Jurassic numbers as well. So you're gonna have to go on Google and ask Google that question. But thanks for asking it. It's a good reminder that I need to like remember these things. <laughs> all right. No, that's no worries at all. Nobody can do <laughs> everything. And that's the beauty of Google. I was able to hop on really quickly. And it was about 200 million <laughs> years ago was the Jurassic. Yeah, perfect. So what, what the time period that I tend to work on is the late Cretaceous. So the last like 20 to 25 million years of the dinosaurs existence. That's actually where we know the most about most dinosaurs. Uh, it's where a lot of the dinosaurs in Alberta come from. So places like Dinosaur Provincial Park. 
And Buster is probably about 67 million years old. So the Cretaceous period ends with a bang 66 million years ago. So Buster is living about a million years before that big extinction event that kills most of the dinosaurs except birds. So he's one of the very last dinosaurs. All right, let's get back to our live classrooms. Let's go to Farmington, Missouri. We've got some eighth graders hanging out with Mrs. Moore and Mrs. Dillon. Let's get <laughs> the microphone turned on. How are we doing, Missouri? Great. <laughs> Um, I'm Brock, and I'm wondering how many fossils have you and your team discovered so far? How can you say that one more time for me? How many fossils have you guys discovered so far? Oh, how many fossils have we discovered so far? So from the site where we thought Buster came from, we found Buster and then about a hundred plant fossils. But the collection at the Royal BC Museum has probably about 90,000 fossils in it. And we have fossils from all different time periods with a focus on British Columbia. And so British Columbia's fossil record goes all the way back to basically the beginning of the fossil record. We have um, uh, an amazing record of animals from the Cambrian period from the Burgess Shale that's located in British Columbia. That's a really famous fossil locality if you like paleontology. Um, our collection has lots of Cretaceous, so dinosaur aged fossils from marine sediments. So from, from like the ocean that was like the sort of ancient ocean that covered Vancouver Island. Um, so we have lots of things like ammonites and clams and crabs and all kinds of cool stuff like that. And we also have lots of plants and insect fossils from the period right after the dinosaurs go extinct from the Eocene period about 55, 50 million years ago. So that's where our strengths are right now. And my job is partly to fill up our collection of bony animals like dinosaurs and especially animals from the Mesozoic era, the time that dinosaurs were alive. All right, very cool. We're gonna go to a classroom now that isn't too, too far away. They're joining uh, from British Columbia as well. They're in Courtney. Oh, great. Uh, this is Matthew. Oh. Let's get the microphone turned on. There it is. How are we doing, boys and girls? Yeah. <laughs> uh, how would BC different when the mountain dinosaurs was alive? For example, the climate. Oh, can you say it one more time? I call. How was BC? That's the very end of your question. How How was BC different when the mountain dinosaur was alive? For example, oh, the climate. That is a great. Great question. So the question is, how was the environment in British Columbia different when Buster was alive, especially the climate? That's a super question. So when Buster was alive in northern British Columbia, this is really weird, but it was actually located further south than most of Alberta and Montana. So where Buster lived, even though it's really far north now, was actually down at about the border of Oregon and Idaho. So really far south. And that's partly because British Columbia is made up of all these tectonic plates, all these chunks of land that have smushed onto the rest of North America and then slid all over the place and mostly slid north. So Buster was actually located really far south. There were mountains rising on either side. So the Rocky Mountains were pushing upwards and Buster lived in this little valley in between the mountains. It would have been a lot warmer than it is there now today. And the forest probably would have had lots of ferns, um, and the forest was probably also made of this tree called the Dawn Redwood Meta Sequoia. So kind of like a, 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 a conifer tree with needles that will drop during the winter time. And so it was probably warmer, pretty lush, but not quite as swampy and humid as say Alberta at that time period, which would have been sort of facing the ocean at that time. So I hope that answers your question. We still have a lot to learn about where Buster lived, but that's the general idea. That's a great oh, question. Right. That was a great question. Um, perfect. I'm going to steal another question from our YouTube crowd. This is from the French school in Philadelphia. They are sixth graders and they're wondering if it's true that most dinosaurs lived in North America or were they pretty much spread out everywhere? Okay, so were dinosaurs mostly found in North America? No, dinosaurs have been found all over the world. Now, part of the problem is that like, 
we've found a lot of dinosaurs in North America because we've spent a lot of time looking for dinosaurs in North America. Um, and there's lots of places where it's easy to find dinosaurs because we've got big, dry desert areas with rocks at the surface that are the right age to find dinosaurs. But other places that are really important for dinosaur hunters like myself are places like China and Mongolia, anywhere where there's big deserts, those are good places to look for fossils. Um, but uh, the United Kingdom and France and lots of places in Europe have lots of fossils. There are fossils found in Egypt and Morocco, in Africa and in South Africa. There are fossils from Australia. There are lots of fossils in South America in places like Argentina and Brazil. And there are fossils in Antarctica, right in the very center of Antarctica in the mountains that push up through the glaciers. So anywhere where you've got rocks from the right time period and the right general type, so rocks that were laid down by rivers or lakes or sand dunes uh, that were in that sort of 250 million to 66 million year time frame, you might be able to find dinosaurs. And so those rocks can happen anywhere. And But there's still lots of places where we don't know a lot about the dinosaurs that could have lived in those areas, just like Northern British Columbia. So that's why there's still lots of exploration that needs to happen. All right, excellent. Lots of ideas for future careers. Um, oh yeah, so much we have to find. definitely not found Better. all the dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, let's see. Brampton, Ontario, grade fives, hanging out with Mrs. Miller. Let's get your microphone turned Great. on. How are we doing, grade fives? <laughs> Wait, how do you like take the fossils out of the ground without breaking them? And like, how do you like set them up? Like, ah, okay. So how, how do we take them out of the ground without breaking them? And then how do we set them up like in these exhibits? Yeah. yeah okay. Perfect. That's a great question. So some of the ways that we take fossils out of the ground uh, involve uh, the possibility of breaking them. So we actually have to be really careful. Some fossils like Buster were found just lying loose on the surface. So they had eroded out of the cliff and were just sitting there and able to be picked up basically, which is pretty interesting. Um, some fossils though need uh, hammers and chisels and you sit there and you kind of carefully hammer and chisel around the fossil, never right on the fossil itself, but around it. What we usually do is we sort of dig around the fossil and then down and then under. We make kind of like a little mushroom pedestal for the fossil. We will then wrap it up either in tissue paper or if it's really fragile, we'll use things like medical bandages. It's a little plaster of Paris bandages. Um, and sometimes if it's a really big fossil, we will use burlap, which is basically potato sacks or the stuff that you might wrap trees up with in the winter time and dunk that in plaster and then wrap that all over the fossil. And that basically sort of encases it in this protective plaster jacket. And that helps us bring things back safely. We usually leave a lot of rock on the fossil itself, uh, so we don't sort of clean it up all the way while we're sitting outside. We leave a lot of the rock around it and then we carefully remove that back at the lab, at the museum or the university. Um, working outside is really hard. Uh, you can get rained on, you can get hailed on, sometimes it's just really hot. So we usually like to do most of the fossil cleanup in a nice controlled environment. Um, uh, let's see, so what else? Sometimes, a lot of the time you have to just carry the fossils out in your arms or on your backpack. So you have to be really strong um, and you have to be okay with being a bit uncomfortable sometimes. Sometimes if things are really, really heavy, we might use helicopters to lift them to another location or if they're like on the side of a cliff that's really steep. Um, so that's also really fun when you get to see the helicopter come in and you gotta like stand there and like hook your net onto it and then like run away so that it doesn't get dropped on you or anything like that. Um, so that's always really exciting. Uh, and then a lot of the time we just drive them back in trucks to the university and then use our arms and unload them again. Or sometimes we might use forklifts if they're really heavy. Uh, and then we clean them up here. We also use things like special glues and consolidants, special plastics that help the fossil stay strong. So we'll kind of drip that onto the fossils um, with little glue droppers and that helps keep the fossil strong in the field and once we're back at the lab. So I hope that answers that question. Uh all right, absolutely. Let's take another trip to California. <laughs> Mrs. Prizman's got some students <laughs> hanging out with her. Let's turn that microphone on. How are we doing, boys and girls? <laughs> All right, who's got a question? Um, 
Where do T Rexes live? Ah, where did T Rexes live? Everybody loves T Rex. I like T Rex too. Um, even though T-Rex tends to eat most of the dinosaurs that are my favorites. Um, so T-Rex actually lived in a really large part of North America right at the end of the age of dinosaurs. So we've found T-Rex fossils in South Dakota, in Montana. There are close relatives of T-Rex in New Mexico and Utah. Uh, we have found T-Rex fossils in Alberta and also in Saskatchewan. So one of the biggest ones ever found is Scotty from Saskatchewan. And one of the most famous ones is Sue at the Field Museum and she came from South Dakota. Oh, have we lost the lost the feed here it's quiet on my end oh sorry can you hear me now oh no that's okay yeah i can hear you now <laughs> all right perfect all right. i was just saying perfect. we love the t-rex it's hard not to get caught up in the king of the dinosaurs <laughs> it's true everybody likes t-rex <laughs> all right well we need to take a little trip to petawawa we're going to hang out with some grade five sixes uh, mrs robinson's class let's get their microphone turned on great uh, oh there we go how are we doing boys and girls when you discover the fossils of bones, how do you determine what type of fossil the dinosaur is? Ah, that's a great question. So when we find a new dinosaur bone, how do we know what kind of dinosaur it is? So part of that is that I just went to school for like a really long time to learn about dinosaurs. So I did a four-year undergraduate degree in geology and biology, and then I did a two-year master's degree in paleontology, and then I did a PhD for five years. So by the time I finished my PhD, it was kind of like graduating from grade 22. Um, and so you just do a lot of school and you spend a lot of time looking at fossils in other museums, studying those fossils, and basically getting kind of like a little mental library of different dinosaur bone shapes that help you identify them. Actually, I can show you one of my research notebooks if you'd like to see it. I brought one down with me. So this is the kind of work that I do when I'm looking at new dinosaur fossils. I go to museums or I work in the museum that I'm in here and I take lots of sketches and notes and measurements. And I have lots and lots of notebooks like this where I have little drawings and diagrams and lots of numbers and measurements. Let's find some really cool pages in here. Oh yeah, here's a good one. So this is when I was working on Buster. I went to a lot of different museums and took measurements of feet because that might be one of the things that differentiates Buster from other dinosaurs. And so it just takes a long time, basically. You just have to like do a lot of reading, look at lots of fossils, and eventually you sort of get the hang of what bones go where in the body and how to tell different shapes of bones uh, apart for different types of dinosaurs, which is really fun. It's part of the job that I really, really like actually. So I love sitting there with fossils and learning about the anatomy. All right. Thanks for showing us that notebook. And whew, grade 22, I think you're going to be scaring a few of us. <laughs> but it's really fun. And it's a little bit different from being in a classroom. So as you get older and you go into those master's and PhD degrees, it's more like an apprenticeship than sort of taking classes all the time. So you start to become more independent and you develop your own research projects and become very sort of self-motivated. So it, it changes and it's a bit different, but it's time to be in school, that's for sure. <laughs> All right, so a quick question from online before we visit a few more of our live classrooms. Uh, one of our online groups is wondering if you've ever found a raptor fossil. <laughs> oh, have I ever found a raptor fossil? That's a really good question. I have worked in places where we could find raptor fossils. So I've been really lucky to get to go to the Gobi Desert of Mongolia, which is the home of Velociraptor from Jurassic Park. Velociraptor is actually too big in Jurassic Park. You probably already know this, but Velociraptor is really small. It's more like the size of a coyote or a big dog. Um, so I haven't ever found any Velociraptor fossils, but I have found teeth from Velociraptor relatives. They're usually really, really small, and they look a little bit like the, the theropod tooth that I showed earlier. Um, they usually have little serrations on them, but I haven't found like a really good raptor fossil before. That's something that would be really cool to find. <sighs> I'm trying to picture Jurassic Park with the raptors the right size, and it just doesn't have the same <laughs> And fluffy, because they'd also have feathers. 
So right. they look really different, but that's okay because Jurassic Park is doing its own thing and it, it was made before we knew that they'd have feathers. So that's okay, but looks really different from what you might picture if that's what you're used to for Velociraptor. Okay, let's uh, see how many more of our classrooms we can dip back into. So let's start off with our group in Courtney, British Columbia. Your microphone is on again. You can say 12. Hey. Okay. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Okay. Where exactly was the BC mountain dinosaur found and what year did it die? Oh. Questions. Okay, so and what year did it die? So Buster was found in northern British Columbia. Uh, if you fly up to Smithers, um, that gets you most of the way to where it was found. Then you have to charter a bush plane, a little personal plane that just takes a few people and fly for another hour. And we landed on a grass landing strip. So there isn't a real airport there. It's just like a, a big lawn, basically. Um, and then we stayed at this fishing lodge called Saskina Lodge and hiked around on the Sustut River. So it's not really found in like a city or a town uh, because there's no roads up there. It's kind of out in the wilderness, basically. So that's where Buster was found. And Buster was found in 1971, but probably died about 67 million years ago. And we know that based on the work that we did in 2017, because we collected pieces of the rock from where Buster was found. And then one of my colleagues studies fossil pollen. And pollen is actually really good at telling you how old rocks are. And for a lot of really complicated reasons I won't get into now, but we love when we have people and friends that work on fossil pollen because they can basically grind up those rock samples, put them under a microscope, look at the species of pollen that were present in those rocks and give us an estimate for how old the dinosaur is. So the dinosaurs are really cool, but the fossil pollen is super important for understanding those dinosaurs. So we need to look at all the different fossils. All right, let's turn on the microphone in Mrs. Becker's class, see if they have another question. Hi, my name is Hayden, and how many tools have you used? Ooh, that's a great question. How many tools have I used? I use a lot of different tools, actually. So for collecting fossils, I use tools like my trusty old rock hammer. That's my favorite tool. Actually, no, my very favorite tool, I don't have an example here, is called a crack hammer. So it's like a really heavy hammer that you smash into an awl. And I really like that because it makes me feel really strong when I'm using that. Um, but I use other tools like chisels and little brushes and dental picks like at your dentist's office. Uh, we use special droppers with glue. Sometimes in some places I've gotten to use a jackhammer, which I think is pretty fun because you're like, like, it's pretty cool to use a jackhammer. Sometimes we use special saws called rock saws that I think are a little bit scary because they're, they're spinning and they're kind of dangerous, but you hold them out and kind of saw through the rock like this. So that's also pretty fun. Um, what other tools have I used? That's such a great question. I use so many tools. What kind of tools do you guys think a paleontologist might use? Maybe you can give me some suggestions. Um, but, and then I also use tools to study the fossils when I get back here. So I have used things like CT scanners to scan the fossils with x-rays and look inside them. Uh, I use microscopes to look at sections of fossils that have been made really, really thin so I can see the cells inside them. And I use a lot of computers. So I use a lot of computers to do statistics. So basically fancy math. Um, I use computers to make 3D models of those fossils and then to do engineering analyses to them. Um, so that's the really fun thing about this job. Use the tools outside, really cool scientific tools inside to study fossils as well. All right, let's squeeze in another question. Let's go to Mr. Richard's class. Let's see if they have a follow-up. <laughs> so are there any other dinosaur groups Buster might be in? Are there any other dinosaur groups Buster might be in? So Buster is part of this group, this family of dinosaurs called Leptoceratopsidae. And Leptoceratopsids are part of a bigger group of dinosaurs called Ceratopsians. Um, and then that group of dinosaurs is part of an even bigger group called Ornithischia. So Leptoceratopsids are like weird little hornless horned dinosaurs. Ceratopsians are the horned dinosaurs, things like Triceratops, Protoceratops, 
um, Centrosaurus, Pachyrhinosaurus, Ceracosaurus, lots of cool horned dinosaurs. Um, and then all of the horned dinosaurs, including Buster, are part of this bigger group of dinosaurs called Ornithischia, which is basically most of the plant-eating dinosaurs. That also includes things like Ankylosaurs, the armored dinosaurs, Pachycephalosaurs, the dome-headed dinosaurs, and Hadrosaurs, the duck-billed dinosaurs. So we're pretty sure that Buster is a Leptoceratopsid, but you know, maybe someday someone finds a more complete specimen and there's something really weird about the head or the tail and that makes us reinterpret it again. But for now, we are pretty sure that it's a Leptoceratopsid. All right, you know what? I think we can squeeze in one more. So let's go to- All right, great. Uh, Mrs. Prizman's class in California, see if they have one more. How old? Great. How old can a dinosaur get? Oh, how old can a dinosaur get? That's a great question. I love that question. So we don't know exactly how old Buster was when it died, um, but we can tell that for certain other dinosaurs if we cut up the fossil bones. So if we cut up parts of the limb bones, especially like the leg bones or the arm bones, um, we can actually see growth rings inside those bones that record the sort of years that the dinosaur was alive, roughly with a little bit of like math involved. Um, so it's kind of like a tree ring. If you've ever seen like a stump or like the rings that are in a tree when it's growing, dinosaurs basically have tree rings inside their bones. They have dinosaur rings basically. Um, and so some of the oldest dinosaurs are actually T-Rexes. So Tyrannosaurus rex might've been able to live to like 30 to 35 years old. Some of the biggest oldest ones are only about 30 to 35. So just for comparison, that's about how old I am roughly. Um, and so it's a little weird to think that a dinosaur wouldn't necessarily live a whole lot longer than I did. Um, but a lot of animals today don't necessarily have very long lifespans. So 35 is actually pretty good for a big predatory dinosaur that would have had to compete with other big predators for food, um, that might have been preyed upon itself when it was very young and small, um, and that probably like battled other, other uh, predatory dinosaurs when it was like mating time too. Um, so 35 is actually probably pretty good. Uh, we don't really have a good idea for a lot of other dinosaur groups, but it seems like at least for T-Rex, 35 is about as old as it got. Pretty good. All right. Well, I know this is a topic <laughs> that students could ask questions all day. So Victoria, I'm wondering <laughs> if you would mind if we needed more questions your way afterwards, if they had some more burning questions. Yes, that sounds great. Okay, and I believe it's at Victoria Arbor on Twitter. That's me, yep. I hope that I'll hear from some of you. Perfect. So <laughs> as well, teachers, if you took any pictures today during the event, post those online, tag the museum, tag Victoria. We love to see <laughs> pictures of classrooms in action. Yeah. And Boys and girls, as per usual, thank you for the amazing questions. It's always great to take your questions um, and hear what you're thinking about. So that was pretty awesome. Victoria, yeah, and and at the uh, museum. If I can just also yeah. add that we have a website with more information about Buster. If anyone wants to learn a bit more, it's rbcm.ca slash dinosaurs. You can learn more about Buster and some of the work we're doing here. And yeah, thanks so much for, for, having, me, uh, for having me today and hopefully everyone enjoyed learning about BC dinosaurs. All right, perfect. Well, it was a lot of fun having our virtual field trip to the museum. I am going to turn on the microphone, boys and girls, if you want to get nice and loud, a big <laughs> goodbye and thank you. And we'll sign off for today. So here we go. <laughs>